Hi everybody, welcome to my video on fold and thrust belts, an example from the Andes. In this shaded relief image, we can see the Pacific Ocean to the west, the high Andes Mountains, and the Altiplano Plateau, and then the broad, low relief South American Craton. Separating the high Andes from the Craton is a broad north-south expanse of essentially thrust faults and fold and thrust belts that accommodate compression as the Andes advance eastward out over the Craton. And in this video, we're going to focus in particularly on the sub-Andean fold and thrust belt. And this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, thrusts along the eastern Andes, and in the sub-Andean zone in particular, produce a lot of earthquakes. They're not the biggest earthquakes, but they can be very damaging to population centers out along the eastern side of the Andes. So understanding how these fault systems work is pretty important. Likewise, fold and thrust belts, like the sub-Andean belt, are host to most of the oil and gas deposits in South America. You can see this map, each black dot shows an oil gas deposit and they're mostly concentrated in foreland basins right along the eastern flank of the Andes. And so part of the video today will help explain how oil and gas form in these foreland basin fold and thrust belts. So we'll start off with an overview of the Andes, then we'll look at the architecture of the sub-Andean fold and thrust belt. We'll step back and look at some simple models for fold and thrust, and then we'll finish by looking at the geomorphology of growing folds. So what are the Andes? How are they formed? They're a non-collisional mountain range. And what that means is that unlike the Himalaya, there was never a continent-continent collision in the Andes. Essentially, we have the Nazca plate subducting down beneath the South American plate. However, because this subduction is shallow in some places, it's exerting a compressional traction across the Andes that's essentially placing the whole mountain range under compression and causing faulting both on the western side and on the eastern side. And we can see evidence for that compression in the GPS velocities. So these arrows represent how fast a given point in the crust is moving eastward. And you can see that out here in the, the western side of the Andes, these stations are moving rapidly eastward, and that eastward velocity generally diminishes as we come across the Andes. Now, although these arrows are biggest, it's important to keep in mind these are related to the subduction cycle. And a lot of this eastward motion will be released when the subduction zone snaps back during an earthquake. However, a lot of this shortening out in the east is occurring across the sub-Andean fold and thrust belt. And this shortening is going to be accommodated by earthquakes within the fold and thrust belt that are going to actually lead to permanent strain and permanent shortening along the eastern Andes. And so it's really this area we're going to explore. And here's your first look at it in detail. The, the sub-Andean zone uh, is made up of many north-south parallel ridges. And we're going to show in a minute that each of these ridges is essentially a fold underlain by a fault. But for now, this is just another view that shows that there's quite a bit of shortening accommodated. Points on the west side of the belt are moving eastward at about 10 millimeters per year. And by the time we come across the whole belt, land over here is essentially not moving at all. So we're accommodating roughly 10 millimeters per year of shortening across the sub-Andean belt along this system of folds and faults. So now let's look at what the architecture looks like underneath this region. So here's one more view of it in a shaded relief. Here's the Altiplano Plateau off to the west. Here's the thickened crust of the Cordillera Oriental. And here are those north-south ridge lines, each one a fold, stepping outward uh, into the Foreland Basin. 
And it's worth talking about what a Forland Basin is. Forland Basins sit at the flanks of large mountain ranges. And essentially, as, as steep rivers erode into the flanks of the mountain range, sediment is flushed down the rivers and out into the, the low-lying flat basin. And so one of the key ideas in this video is that in Foreland basins, we're continually accumulating sediment as that sediment is washed from the high mountains down into the low basin valley. All right, so these folds are growing in an environment that's continually receiving new sediment. And just quickly, I'll show you how Foreland basins form. Why is there a basin in the first place? This has to do with the idea that the lithosphere is essentially like a piece of plywood. And when you thicken a big mountain range, like the Andes, you're essentially placing a load onto this piece of plywood, and it causes that to bend downward and flex. So the, the lithosphere or the board is bent here, and that creates a bit of space between the thick crust of the mountain range and between this, this four bulge. And it's into this space that we can shed sediments. This is literally the Foreland Basin. And this is also where these fold and thrust belts are going to propagate outward from the mountain range. So with that background, let's now look at a cross section that reveals the architecture of the sub-Andean belt. So this cross section here goes from A to B, and it literally matches up one to one. And so we'll move from B, from the east, westward into the mountain range. So starting here, notice the first range we come to is the Agua Rague range. And that's this little ridge line right here that's just barely emerging from the Foreland Basin floor. And you can see this is a gentle fold still developing over a thrust fault. As we move further west, we come to the San Antonio range, which is also a fold growing over a fault system. Okay, so San Antonio is this one here. Then we come to the Baja Oran range, Pintascayo, the Pescado, and eventually back to the Cinco Picachos range. So each of these ridge lines is underlain by a, fold, by a fault with a fold above it. So these ridges are literally the folds themselves popping out of the Foreland Basin. And please notice in this cross section, a lot of these sedimentary layers are older, Silurian, Devonian, but everything in white or above it here is essentially myopliocene sediments that were shed recently into the Foreland Basin. So these are typically sediments that are less than 10 million years old in this case, that were recently eroded off the Andes and then deformed by the growing folds. And so just to summarize some of the ideas here, what are the attributes of the sub-Andean fold and thrust belts, or attributes of most fold and thrust belts in general? Well, a very common characteristic is that faults splay upward from a basal decolmont. In this case, and so a decolmont is essentially a weak layer running uh, beneath the fold and thrust belt. Very often, this weak layer is going to be within a layer of sediment that might be a shale or it might have a lot of slippery salt in it, something that makes the sedimentary layers weak and able to slip freely at a relatively low angle. So in the case of the sub-Andean fold and thrust belt, the whole belt is riding on a basal decolmont uh, within a Silurian sedimentary unit. And all of these individual thrusts splay upward from that same decolmont. Okay, so the whole thing's moving outwards, and then each of these thrusts are popping upward, essentially stepping up from one sedimentary layer upward into a younger sedimentary layer. And we're going to see in a second that's how faults form. One other thought about this, in general, these thrusts are younger as you go 
further outward or further to the east. And this is very analogous to the critical wedge idea, which we reviewed in a previous video. So these faults are generally younger to the east. So now let's look in detail at how these faults and folds co-evolve together. So one key idea about folds in a sediment is that they tend to grow as the sedimentary layers are ramped up and over thrust faults, okay? So here's the underlying thrust fault, and here's the folded sediment sitting above it. So some basic vocabulary. The fold axis is essentially the direction running parallel to the fold crest. The forelimb of the fold tends to be the steeper outer facing limb of the fold. And the back limb tends to be the gently dipping uh, ramp along the back. So one way you can remember this is the forelimb is the one that is essentially facing in the direction that the thrust is going. And it tends to be steeper. So if we look a little bit in detail, I'll show you two examples of how faults can form over a thrust. And I should say there's a huge body of literature on this, and we're just going to skim the surface here. One example is called a fault bend fold. And essentially, this occurs as sediments are translated along a flat-lying decolmont. And then when they hit a ramp, essentially a ramp in the thrust fault, where the thrust cuts upward to a higher sedimentary level, these sedimentary layers are forced to go up and over the ramp. And as they go through these corners, they essentially fold, and the sediments buckle upward into a fold. And that particular geometry is called a fault bend fold because it forms over a bend in the fault. And it's worth taking a quick look at one of Rick Almendinger's videos, which shows this in detail. So here's the thrust ramp in red. The rocks are gonna, uh, on the top of the ramp are going to move left to right, and we're going to watch a fold develop as they pass over the thrust ramp. Here we go. Notice the fault bend fold developing. And then the, the fault's going to step back, and we're going to get what's called a duplex as a second fold grows uh, over the new version of the thrust ramp. So we'll just watch that one more time. Sedimentary layers ramped up and over with a fold growing above them. So a second way that faults can form above a thrust is by what's called a slip gradient fold. In this case, you don't necessarily need to have a bend in your fault, but if you simply have higher slip rates at depth and lower or zero slip at the surface, essentially what happens is sedimentary layers in the back are forced up and over, while these layers are essentially stuck. And we can develop a slip gradient fold um, above this particular thrust. So now that you've visualized thrust faults in cross-section, let's look a little bit about how they grow in three dimensions. This diagram shows essentially a fault under the surface with two anticlines growing above it. And we might ask, why are these anticlines shaped this way? Why are they higher in some places and lower in others? Why is there a saddle between them? The reason is that we know the anticline grows in response to slip along the underlying thrust fault. However, that slip isn't constant everywhere along the thrust fault. Right? The, the slip may be higher right here and lower right here. And the slip may end at some point along strike of the fault. It doesn't go on forever. And what we see is that areas of the fault plane that have the highest slip or displacement have the highest or biggest growth of anticline above them, and that tapers off laterally as we get to the edges of the fault plane where slip on the fault is less. So this is what controls a three-dimensional shape. It's also worth noting that this is what controls the growth of anticlines over time also. As they grow higher, they also grow laterally outwards. And under ideal conditions, that ratio of vertical growth to lateral growth is fixed, and so the anticline will keep the same shape 
uh, over time as it grows. It gets bigger, and then the tip of the anticline migrates out laterally. So now that you understand something about the geometry of fold and thrusts, let's finish the video by looking at how fold growth affects the landscape, how it interacts with rivers and alluvial fans in particular. And it's helpful to picture the environment in which a lot of these folds are growing. Many of these grow above thrust faults that have just stepped outward from a mountain front. So imagine this. Here's a mountain front in Death Valley with a big alluvial fan across it. Imagine we have a growing fault underneath the subsurface that's going to start to develop a fold whose axis is along this line. We're essentially going to develop a ridge in front of this alluvial fan. What's going to happen? Well, the most obvious thing is that this, the, the rivers and streams that, that ephemerally feed this fan are going to be blocked. The, the rivers are going to have to go around, or the sediment's going to have to be deposited as this new anticline ridge grows. And that's, that's one of the key ideas. And we can really think about these geomorphic impacts in terms of three key impacts. One. Uplift of folds is going to uplift and deform the existing fan. So quite often, folds will warp the original alluvial surface and change its shape. Okay. Likewise, they're going to cause deflection or incision of river systems. Okay. In this example, the river wasn't deflected, but it actually had to cut down vertically or incise into the growing anticline. And three, the rise of this growing anticline is going to change the pattern of sediment deposition, both above the fold and downstream of the fold. And one very common thing that happens is we form what's called a piggyback basin. And a piggyback basin is essentially when we trap those alluvial sediments between the mountain front and the folded fan, and we create new space to store sediment in here, and we pile up sediments in a basin that's essentially riding piggyback on the back of this thrust system. So that's a piggyback basin. So I'll finish the video now with a few examples of this. And we'll start with the Wheeler Ridge Anticline, which sits just south of Bakersfield, California. And this really exhibits a couple classic behaviors. So it was an alluvial fan with water flowing this way with the blue arrows. And then the anticline grew up above a blind thrust. And so the axis runs left to right here. And as the anticline grew, the river used to go this way. The river was formerly passing northward in this direction. But as the anticline grew, it defeated the river and deflected the river around to the east uh, where it currently flows today. So the river was defeated and deflected as the anticline grew in front of it. This abandoned valley is called a wind gap. Okay? And this valley where the river currently is still cutting down is called a water gap, where the river is still sitting. And as the anticline grew, of course, we filled in the area behind it with sediment. And this is a, a pretty classic example of a piggyback basin. Now let's multiply this and zoom out to an even larger scale example. I'll take you to the Zhengar Basin in the Tian Shan of northwestern China. So we're located right up here, north of the Himalaya Tibet, north of the Tarim Basin, up in the Tian Shan mountain belt. And sure enough, we've got a fold and thrust belt where a thrust has just stepped northward from the mountain front. Okay into this foreland basin. And we see a few classic things. We see the anticlines developing above the thrusts. Um, and there you can see that they are blocking the rivers. Okay, In this case, most of the rivers have been able to keep pace and carve water gaps down through the growing anticline. So they're successfully cutting through the anticline. But we also see that we're getting a lot of sedimentation in piggyback basins 
behind the growing anticline here. And I'll just show that, that same image. This is flipped upside down now, but it's the same area. Um, this is what this looks like in satellite image view. So here's the growing anticline. You can see the symmetric sedimentary beds folded across either side of the anticline. Okay. You can see the river coming down and cutting through the anticline. The piggyback basin is up here. And notice we're getting also a lot of deformation, a lot of deposition in alluvial fans as that river comes through the anticline and spreads out and sprays sediment uh, in the downstream side of the anticline. And I want to point out one other thing here. This is an emergent anticline, okay? Notice how this fan is being blocked as yet another anticline grows up in front of it here, okay? And so this is a propagating anticline tip. This anticline's growing right to left. And one of the important things here is that a lot of sediments are being deposited across the tip of the anticline. Over here, it has emerged from the sediments. But over here, the growing anticline is still being buried by sediments. It hasn't popped up quite yet. And when in that situation, we get what are called growth strata. These are sedimentary layers that are deposited um, on, on the limbs of a growing fold as it tries to emerge upwards from the sediment. But as long as that fold is still being buried, then we get these sloping strata that actually record the geometric changes of the fold as it grows. So these growth strata are very important to geologists who try to interpret the history of fold growth over time. Well, we've learned a lot in this video, and I just want to bring it back to our motivating example of the subandean belt in the eastern Andes. And this is a satellite image of all the north-south ridges. And we can see so many classic things going on here. We see rivers that have been blocked by a growing anticline ridge. And they've been deflected around until they join with another river that has enough energy to power through and cut down through the anticlines. Likewise, you can imagine as the next anticline grows further out to the east of the belt, it's being buried by sediment that's coming along this river, and growth strata are accumulating until this next anticline can pop up from within the Foreland Basin. So in summary, fold and thrust belts form when multiple faults splay upwards off a of basal décolmant. And the décolmant is often a weak sedimentary layer, sometimes associated with salt layers, that slips very, very easily at a low angle. Folds grow above blind thrusts that don't necessarily reach the surface. We showed two examples where folds grow above a thrust ramp or due to a gradient in displacement along the thrust. As that anticline fold grows, forelimbs are typically steeper and they face in the direction of thrust motion, and the back limbs are generally shallower. And we also showed that folds often grow in foreland basins, stepping outward from the mountain front. And as new folds grow in the foreland basins, they disrupt the pattern of river flow and sediment delivery into the basin. They can reroute rivers, and they can change the pattern of sediment deposition, causing things like piggyback basins and alluvial fans. So I'll leave you with these concept questions and see you in class.